You're watching Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Pedro. We discuss Neo Coin, FinCEN guidance, and crypto used to pay taxes. All this and more on episode 245 here on Tuesday, March 6, 2018. In the traditional markets, we have gold up to $1,334, silver's up to $16.75, oil is up to $62.46, the Dow is up to 24875 points, and the 30-year U.S. Treasury yield is down to 3.14%. And in the crypto markets, we have Bitcoin Cash down to $1,188. Bitcoin Segwit is down to $10,716. Ethereum is down to $811. Dash is down to $577. And Litecoin is down to $195. Thank you for that, Pedro and Darren. Just a reminder that you can tune into Neocash Radio every week. Don't want to miss a single awesome moment of Neocash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Podcast Addict, and more. We now have video. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Like, share the videos. Neocash Media YouTube channel. Well, starting out, we've got... A, there's so much to talk about, of course. But let's talk about some hardware news. Pedro, you've got a story about uh, our hardware wallets. Yeah, so uh, the Ledger Nano S, a very popular uh, and good uh, hardware wallet, uh, has a new firmware. Version 1.4.1 has been released. So Le Ledger reports that on March 20th, this update is mandatory, though it's unclear what will happen if the device is not updated after that time. So worth noting is that if the device is upgraded to version 1.4.1, it cannot be downgraded to the last major version, uh, which is 1.31. So some of the uh, new things that this brings is uh, the number of apps that can be loaded onto Nano S at the same time can be raised up to 18, depending on the cryptocurrencies. And they did this by uh, using a lot of common libraries among um, a lot of the coins uh, that are based off Bitcoin, for example. Uh, the lock screen management has been uh, slightly modified, so a long press of th three seconds on both buttons, and uh, it'll allow you to lock the screen. Um, it's going to ensure that you've backed up the correct 24-word seed when you initialize the device. So now when you're initializing, it'll ask you to confirm all 24 instead of uh, a random uh, group. Uh, several other optimizations have been implemented that'll um, help with the user experience. So, for example... Uh, the the device is now faster uh, when opening when opening up due to some caching. Uh, cryptographic support has been extended with uh, a lot more elliptical curves, and uh, there's a few other security improvements. Um, for example, uh, to load third-party apps is slightly evolved. You have to go into a, a recovery mode. So the update update process is available on the Ledger website. Uh, we'll have a, a link to that. Uh, and it notes that uh, when you do upgrade, you will not need to re-enter in your seed words, which is um, uh, different than the previous upgrade where you did. So uh, upcoming from Ledger in 2018 also includes um, they're going to be releasing uh, some native apps uh, and retiring the uh, Chrome apps. Excellent. Well, thanks for that, Pedro. Now, why might someone want to use a hardware wallet? I mean, what are some of the pros and cons of using well, a hardware wallet? It's it's the idea behind a hard, hardware wallet, wallet is that the the secret information, the private key, is stored on the hardware wallet, and it never leaves the hardware wallet. So, if you want to spend your crypto, uh, your your crypto, you would plug the hardware wallet into a device that is online, like a computer, and. Uh, the uh, the the software would send the transaction to be signed on the ledger, Nano, and then uh, and then that could be broadcast to the network. So the the hardware wallet will only release signed transactions. It won't release the private keys. So the the thinking behind that is it's going to be much more secure. If you have a, uh, the the thinking is that if you have a compromised computer, they still wouldn't be able to um, to just basically hijack your wallet. So. Excellent. Uh, so that that's the point of having a hardware wallet. So so make sure you keep your seed phrase backed up in some other location once again, uh, because you don't want to keep all your seeds in one basket, mm -hmm. if you yeah. will. Now that's that's the thing. If somebody else does get that seed phrase, that could hijack your wallet. But uh, right. But uh, yeah, that's. But if you, you it, there's always this nice mix of you know um, security and ease of use. Right. So it's imp it's important to have that backup so that way. 
uh, it's not, you know, if, if the thing breaks or whatever, you can still access everything. Yeah, you can you can restore that back up onto a, an, another new device that you purchased right. if you lost yours. Well, the Pineapple Fund donating Bitcoins to charity, the Pineapple Fund at pineapplefund.org was started in December of 2018 by an anonymous donor of the name Pine, nicknamed Pine, who claims to be among the, the 250 largest holders of Bitcoin. The aim of the fund is to give away $86 million worth of Bitcoin and has so far given away $20 million to 13 organizations. One of the largest. Pretty yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> One of the largest recipients has been the Open Medicine Foundation, which received $5 million from the fund, which is more, more than the $2 million it's able to raise in all of 2017. Wow. So the Open Medicine Foundation focuses on research for chronic complex diseases. There are many wealthy cryptocurrency holders who are, who are going to have major impact on funding, not just medical research, but charitable giving overall. Right. And I think this is this is worth noting. There there have been a lot of people that have been in the crypto space since it began and could be very, you know, see a lot of wealth right now. And like a, a lot of people that become extremely wealthy, they look to uh, do some donations and philanthropy. So it'll, it'll be very interesting to see what these crypto million and, and billionaires are going to start to uh, do, not just with charity, but also with uh, funding maybe high risk projects, uh, high risk as in, in financial, um, you know, so they can actually be sponsoring some really cool projects and it's exciting. interesting. I mean, even in our own new, um, New Hampshire, there's the human action foundation. They were able to raise a quarter million dollars to build their new Praxium and they're still uh, locating the new location of that. But, uh, and I, I mean that, um, a lot of that was funded by the Liberty community. And I, I don't know how much crypto was, donated, but I'm sure there was some, uh, or, or at least maybe a, a substantial proportion right. uh, was, was crypto. So, so we see, we see the philanthropy all over and it. it's wonderful. That's right. Well, moving on, the U S state of Georgia is considering Bitcoin and other cryptos for tax payments. This is a big story. Yes. Two senators of the state have proposed a bill that would allow citizens to pay their tax liabilities in Bitcoin. The bill states, quote, the commissioner shall accept as valid payment for taxes and license fees any cryptocurrency, including but not limited to Bitcoin. That's great. And that uses that uses an electronic peer-to-peer -peer system, unquote. All right. So there there I mean that's literally that's like one of the first dominoes yeah. to start falling is once the government starts taking as a tax payment, it sort of legitimizes it to the nth degree of being wealth. Yeah. I mean, if the yeah. government takes it, well, why don't you, you know? Yeah. And, and, and you know, it's an absurd argument. but And it's getting to the point where the government's like, hey, wait a minute, we can get paid in this. And it reminds me of uh, a comment uh, my friend Ofer once told me years back, which is always make it as easy as possible for other people to give you money. So uh, I, th I think we're going to be seeing more governments on state and national levels across the world um, you know, they, they want their tax payments and they're going to see that crypto is a way that they can accept them. Right. So um, Shapeshift is now batching Bitcoin transactions. Shapeshift, which accounts for 2% two per, two of the Bitcoin network, is batching transactions. This is allowing lower minor fees while utilizing less transaction space. This update, along with Shapeshift integrating SegWit in the fall of 2017, that was a long time ago, has resulted in Shapeshift offering one of the lowest minor fees in, in its industry. And, and when they batch transactions, what they do is they, they basically make one transaction that pays several people. And so uh, you do save some, uh, some bytes that way and you make it a little bit smaller. Um, yeah, so there we go. Batching is a process where multiple, uh, yeah, so are, Excellent. are bundled in one transaction ID. And the, um, the examples they gave are, are pretty good. So now Shapeshift is saying their average minor fee um, is about a dollar and two cents, and compared to some other uh, exchanges, we have some that are as high as uh, ten dollars. Yeah, right. So, and that, that's um, with Bit Bitcoin SegWit. Um, yeah. So. And that's with the recent uh, decline in in mempool. Uh, mempool got cleared out. A lot more people are using, as we mentioned last week. A lot of people are utilizing the SegWit uh, uh, transactions to yeah. help get the mempool cleared out. Batching transactions is another way. Um, but of course, you know, it also, we're, you know, what kind of use is going on other, other blockchains too. But I think that's honestly, that's probably the best 
for anything. It's, yeah, it's why, why have Bitcoin deal with all of the transactions? Why have it be the one coin that rules them all when it just makes sense? You can shard everything by just using other blockchains that do, you know, do a very good job of securing the blockchain and, and their code base and whatnot. So, well, we've got another, this is sort of a little bit different story. Yes. Pedro? So the NEO blockchain goes down after a node temporarily disconnects. Uh, formerly Ant Shares, NEO, the sixth largest uh, market cap cryptocurrency, went down on March 3rd after a single validator node disconnected. NEO is a blockchain for smart contracts. There are only seven node validators on the NEO blockchain, and all of them are run by the project. The fact that the network came to a stop when only one of these was offline is in direct contrast with almost every other cryptocurrency that accounts for offline nodes. The NEO senior R&D manager, Malcolm L Rider posted on Discord, quote, the problem happens when a consensus node gets disconnected during the consensus. Other consensus nodes are waiting for a reply from that node. It was restored by restarting all nodes for a forced change view. There's a pending patch to handle this edge case automatically, end quote. So I think it's really scary that a $7 billion market cap blockchain is secured by only by the project's seven validator nodes. So I think I'm going to stick with Ethereum for smart contracts. <laughs> well, this was hyped, very much hyped to be the Ethereum killer. And so there's, there will also have a link to the statement from the Neo Council on the blog uh, in their side of the story. But what they use is they use distributed Byzantine fault tolerance. Yeah. Uh, delegated, I'm sorry, Byzantine fault tolerance. I just wrote that word the other day. So... Um, basically, it's these nodes are elected by the token holders to be the, the consensus nodes. And these consensus nodes determine which blocks are created. And which, obviously, by, by doing that, they determine which transactions are, are added into blocks. You, you know who solved the problem with Byzantine fault tolerance? Who's that? Satoshi Nakamoto in his paper, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer <laughs> digital cash system. That's, I'm serious. Like, <laughs> like, they, they, <laughs> you're right. You're, you're totally right, Darren. Satoshi solved this problem nine years ago. <laughs> That's right. But what? So this, you know, this. There's a. There's of course. There's their response, and I'm, it's a, it's too long for me to really want to read yeah, and get into. Oh, no, sorry about that. We didn't architect their, our thing to work very well, and it, we're not a peer. And somebody tell Georgia that NEO is not a peer to peer anything. Okay. Okay. Because well, seven I, nodes is not a No, peer. I think this There's demonstrates... Not a peer make, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And, and one aspect of the Neo blockchain is that it's capable of being strictly controlled. A 51% attack does not depend on hashing power, but rather a consortium that owns 51% of the tokens. They, the majority, decide the number of nodes and then vote for their own nodes. This one group can control the block propagation and effectively determine what happens, what gets in and what doesn't get in. I think this is... This is a very bad thing. The fact that this can happen with Neo, and that that is, let alone that it is happening, does not necessarily I, lend itself to a very high uh, consideration. I, I think the fact that, as Pedro mentioned, there's eight billion dollars behind this project, like just in seven money billion, that's yeah, not, seven like billion, that. so the that's, money that's not being utilized now because well, people are deciding yeah, but it's to keep it's Neo. the market cap. Yeah, I know, which it's is not a, a real fictional. Thing, but, but just the fact there's so much money behind it really says to me that people aren't doing their research in this space. I've, there's a lot of hype. Know, I've been so surprised about how the market moved. You know, I thought it would adjust to, you know, the news a lot quicker than it has. But, uh, I mean, we have evidence that people are not doing their homework right here. Well, and, and, and honestly, this is one way to centralize and control and still have a blockchain and it, well, and the next the next news story here, and we just have a short blur, but there is a possibility of the People's Bank of China running their own digital asset exchange in the future. Uh, once regulations are in place and sort of things have changed, China running their own exchange, having their own currency, it doesn't necessarily it, it you know fall into the same parameters of the cryptocurrency at large. What what currently is being used, Bitcoin, for example, Dash, Ethereum. Uh, even waves, they're all independent, you know, the open sort of uh, coins, and and I, you know we'll see what happens with Neo and we'll see what happens with this. But so the, so the Chinese government basically is making, uh, you know, exchange digital exchanges illegal except for theirs. That's yes. Well, that's how you nationalize something, right? <laughs> 
which which kind of like for a moment we talk about the petrol venezuela's trying to sell they're trying to have this ico where they sell barrels of oil right in the form of a petrol and you can buy their petrol for u.s dollars and then you know fund them and then you have a petrol backed token and but this doesn't make any sense it's like where do you go to take your token and get your barrel of oil well, the, the way I look at the Petro is, it, it, look at the actors behind it, uh, a government that doesn't understand economics. So yeah. why, why would you want to get into that coin? Right. I, I, I certainly won't. <laughs> well, we strongly recommend you, you stay far away from, from that coin. And the Boulevard. And, uh, yeah, the Boulevard. Uh, yeah. Boulevard, yeah. Boulevard. Boulevard. Yeah, and and honestly, I, I, I would be very hesitant to get involved with NEO because I think oh, okay. this is very... This is a very dangerous territory in I mean, which seven nodes control your blockchain. If, if this worked, if this worked where you didn't use the Byzantine fault tolerance, it would have been done before 2009. Yeah. You know, if it worked, and, and it doesn't, so don't right. do it. And, and do your research so you know that it does these things. I know it's hard to read all these things, but and, and personally, I didn't read it either, but I never touched an NEO in my life, so that, I mean, that's that's I, that's a decision I decided to make. If I don't have time to read about something, I'm not touching Darren it. Darren doesn't invest in something he doesn't have the time no. to research. No. And maybe you know what? I think that's a really really smart way of doing things. Yeah, I mean, and also running a node. I also want to run the node or run the software to to actually get an idea of how it's used and how it feels and all of that. And, Right. Well, okay. So this people this, buy it on an exchange. They have no idea what they what, what the heck it is. This letter from the Neo Council. I mean, they talk about how they have a lot of full nodes out there. But once again, just like Bitcoin, just like any any real network, full nodes don't matter. Right. If they don't make blocks, they don't matter. I mean, I, as much as as much as that sounds like a really cold thing to say. Well, they matter a little bit. A little I mean, okay, bit, yeah. transferring along the, the transaction, sure. A, a co- you know, they have a yeah. copy of the blockchain uh, and all that, but do they have any any pull on the network? No. And to your point, JJ, they don't. No. Right? So uh, a, a pure node, uh, great, it has a copy of the blockchain, but if you want to really secure the network, mm-hmm. that node has to be either mining or validating, you know, whatever terminology that blockchain uses. I mean, I mean as somebody who researches this, I mean... Yes, you want more nodes. Like Litecoin doesn't have a lot of nodes, and it's actually so few nodes that it could actually be a problem. Um, when they did have their problem with the um, transactions taking forever to get confirmed, it was different than what happened with Bitcoin. And I tried to look for the reason why that might have happened. The only thing I come up with is there's just so few nodes that it's just not broadcast. Like there's like 300 in the world. Like those are the peering nodes. You can run a node at home, and it probably won't peer with anybody. Or you know, allow any incoming connections. But, um, but anyway, so that that so you want some amount of nodes, right? And well, with all the scaling data we have, we're we're pretty sure that once you get over a certain amount of nodes, then you're basically duplicating resources. You're you're sending, you're using uh, bandwidth to to just get more and more nodes about it. So so having more eventually, you get so many nodes that it doesn't really help. Does that make sense? So, so as far as number of nodes, you kind of want it to be in this in the sweet spot, and it, it, you know, and so if you had that sweet spot of real heavy duty nodes with good software, good hardware behind them, all of that things, good internet connection, all of that, if you're in that sweet spot, then you can support kind of the periphery nodes from that, and that's fine. But um, I mean, just saying, oh, we have a million nodes, and somehow that's better than having two thousand nodes. It doesn't really work like that. Um, so, so yeah. So you can say you have as many nodes as you want, uh, but a healthy network just needs enough. <laughs> right. Right. Thank you for that, Darren. Uh, so next story here is FinCEN. Now, I mean, we've mentioned FinCEN over the years, and they were definitely a part of the the What Is Bitcoin game show way back in the day. Uh, so FinCEN raises major licensing issues for ICOs. So basically what happened is they sent a letter to Congress uh, to a senator, Ron Wyden. And the, the letter basically goes on to say that they, the, the guidance that FinCEN is giving this congressperson is that <clears throat> they think, FinCEN thinks, a developer that sells convertible di- virtual currency, including in the form of ICO coins or tokens, in exchange for another type of value that substitute, substitutes for currency, is a money transmitter 
and must comply. So that's the, the gist of it is, is in regards to ICOs is that the person selling the token, the ICO token, is transmitting money. But it says the developer, so that would mean the person that created the token. Right. I'd imagine. Right. I don't, okay. it's, I don't think it's so. It's I mean, it, Welcome to legal land here, folks. Right. So this is sort of different. It's like it's not like a retailer or reseller that's, that's buying these tokens and then and just that's all they do is they sell tokens. This is someone who creates the token and then sells that token for other tokens, right? So this this is what's going on here. Because uh, so this this doesn't apply to mining because when you mine a coin, you're not exchanging another coin for this coin. You're simply pulling this coin out of the code, right? You're basically mining the coin from the code, and it's like a, a creation of a new coin. So it's handled differently than money transmitting. So so, so if I if I launch a a company and I have a, a token sale and that token sale is you know you send one ether and you get x number of tokens does that mean that fincen now considers that that is a form of exchange yes so you exchange those tokens for ether and that's what fincen is looking at as their guidance on this now that this does not mean it's law right this they're they're looking at the um this this act the secret uh secrecy act bank secrecy act rather than the security acts and they're looking at the Bank Secrecy Act and saying that because they're exchanging one token for another, they're transmitting money. So they have to comply with things like know your customer and... AML, exactly. Yeah. So, and that requires that they collect information. And so the, this, this, uh, this story here um, from coincenter.org, uh, yeah, coincenter.org, basically they come up with two questions. Uh, and they're, they're cool questions. So I'm just going to read them quick here. Uh, question one. Is it wise or appropriate under relevant administrative law to make this substantial change slash clarification in interpretation through a letter to a member of Congress interpreting guidance rather than a public rulemaking or new legislation? Which is a great question. Is This isn't how laws are made. This isn't how big changes. That's, that's a good point. I mean, they say ignorance of the law is no excuse, but here, if you knew all the laws and you didn't see this letter, you know. Right. Then you wouldn't, you mean, wouldn't make nobody, this judgment. I mean, nobody, it's, it's already impossible to read all the laws. And now there's like all this extra legal stuff that they want you to know as well to comply with the law. That's it's right. ridiculous. Well, and then the second point, is it constitutional to mandate private data collection from people who are not financial intermediaries in the traditional sense? And maybe a better analogy to a person selling a new invention to buyers in a person-to-person -person transaction. So that's, that's the thing, a better analogy. It's a new invention. It's something new. It's basically like they mined the coins from their initial... Mm -hmm. I mean, this is just kind of the government trying to s sneak in there and, and make Bitcoin its own, more or less. I mean, like one thing when I first got exposed to Bitcoin, it was like amazing. It was the first thing that you actually could own, right? Because if you own property, you pay property tax. Uh, and if you don't pay it, they'll take it. And uh, if you own pretty much anything, uh, you know, there's all these restrictions on how you use it. And so with, with, like, if you have money in the bank, you know, that can be taken any time you have, you know, this. But with Bitcoin, it's like you just sign this thing with the transaction and you completely direct where it goes. And so, um, and so the government is trying to undo that property of Bitcoin. But I honestly think, JJ, if it's just a person-to-person -person sale, I don't know how FinCEN has anything to do with it. I do kind of understand how they have these rules that if I set up a business and I'm holding everybody else's money and, you know, having, you know, you know, saying I will pay you this money when you want it you know, on demand deposits, I can see definitely may regulating that or having a certification or something that says I'm a good guy that I'm going to actually pay people when they ask me. But if, if I'm not holding anyone else's funds, I don't see how you know, uh, the government needs to get in on a private transaction. And, well, yeah. and, and the other disturbing thing is, you know, these type of, of letters and, and regulations by regulatory agencies, uh, you know, it happens a lot. And, you know, I don't agree with it. So, for example, the FCC here in the United States uh, has uh, mandates that you can't transmit 
you know, more than a quarter of a watt with a small little FM radio, right, uh, transmitter. But that's not a law, right? Congress didn't pass that law. Congress funds the FCC, and the FCC comes out with, well, you got to follow all these regulations, which I, makes it even more difficult because, as you pointed out, there's, you can't stay on top of just the laws that are written. The U.S. Code is so large. So it, it looks like they're just going to keep throwing things like this because, in the end, they don't like this space. Right. Vincent doesn't like this space, and they're going to try to make every transaction in the crypto world one where you know the people that are involved in that transaction. Well, I mean, let's let's look at who's paying that and paying for them. Like, let, let, let's look who's signing the check. You know, ultimately, that's really what it comes down to is when you look at any sort of agency, you look at who's paying these people to create these human actions that do these things. When ultimately, FinCEN is just another our enforcement arm of fiat currency. Yeah. I mean, it's just another enforcement arm of the United States dollar or the World Bank or the IMF or whichever institution, group, or consortium, or cartel you wish to talk about. I mean, so that, I mean, really, that's what it comes down to, is that they're the competition. As we mentioned last week, the banks are starting to realize that because they did not innovate, they are losing ground because of their, you know, the competitive advantage is gone, is, is eroding. And they have first mover advantage, they have all these, these rules in place, and they have the fear of law. But they don't have the innovation. They don't have the spark that that new invention, you know, tra- you know, transpires in in inspires people to feel. Well, I mean, I mean, and shame on them for not bringing that innovation. The fact that it takes you know two to three days to do an ACH transfer here in the U.S. is you know is, is ridiculous. Well, why is the money tied up for three days? Who makes interest on that money? Well, certainly not me. So. They haven't innovated, and you know, as we covered in previous episodes, they're now putting in their quarterly and annual reports that they acknowledge that the crypto world is going to have to force them to innovate and reduce fees. Yeah. Well, and you know what? It's not like we haven't talked about this on Neocash Radio. Uh, add, add, add nauseum to some degree, but it's like, you know what? People are going to keep their honestly, I think a lot of people aren't going to change until they feel some pressure. And that's, I mean, unfortunately, the way it has to be. And then all of a sudden that change isn't as smooth or isn't as, uh, you know, uh, developed or sought out as it, it ought to be. You know, but this something like this, this type of got it could kind of backfire because it, like if you use any of the ones that are supposed to be used, it's currency. Right. You know, instead of selling it, getting some dollars and. Um, and that apparently then having FinCEN involved, right? You, you, it would make a lot more sense to just directly give it to whoever's selling you what you want, right? Well, and that's FinCEN has never said they are involved in anything like that. Like if you want a car, you you give them crypto, you get a car. FinCEN has never said they're involved in that. And, you know, if you need eggs and you give crypto to somebody, they give you eggs. FinCEN never said they've been involved in that. So, um, so this might actually kind of backfire because maybe, you know, people, merchants that want to sell, like if I'm selling cars, I might, there might be this money that's tied up that FinCEN says you can't access your money type deal, or you can't trade it for what you want to trade it for. And so they're like, well, I just want to buy a car. So I'll buy a car. And, and so they're, they're so, so, uh, people will use it instead of sell it. And if, if that happens too much, then, you, you know, there won't be much demand for the U.S. dollar. Uh, you, you see where that's going? I do, Darren. Right? I mean, if everybody's keeping their um, their crypto to use it and merchants are accepting it because they get all these customers with this tied up money, um, uh, I mean, I, I think that's actually a win for, for, for people. So I'm not too worried about this. Well, uh, if you paying attention to the Neocash Radio blog and or other all of our platforms, basically, you will, will have heard that I did an interview. Our first Neocash Newsmakers interview is in the can, as they sort of, it's, it's all history. It's, 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 can you imagine using an eBay-like service for education? Introducing Odom, an international on-demand education marketplace powered by Ethereum and blockchain technologies. In this first installment of Neocash Newsmakers, I interview Odom Chief Executive Officer, 
Richard Magul. We also have a brief moment to talk with Chief Technology Mentor, Dr. Adele Alamessery. We discuss the melding of multiple blockchains to create a peer-to-peer -peer education service platform, smart contracts, reputation on the blockchain, and a brick and mortar company with six years of experience. Welcome to the show, Richard. JJ, um, thanks for having me on and, um, and, and congratulations on your great success with Neocash. Thank you so much, Richard. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your history. So there you go. You can tune in and listen to the whole interview. It's about 35 minutes long. And I talked to both Richard and Dr. Adele. And I mean, it, it, I asked them a lot of questions. We got really in depth and they have a headquarters in uh, Sweden. And they've, so, been, they've been doing this for six years. They've been so, already off the blockchain. They've been doing education on, and education services worldwide. And now they basically want to take what they've learned and then bring it to the blockchain. So will I be able to teach somebody in, let's say, India? Will I be able to teach them calculus through this platform? No, this is more in class. Okay. So this is more focused on you teaching people in your geographic area. It's basically you'd like, you go to Craigslist or eBay and say, hey, I have these skills. Yeah, I've seen those services before, and they're difficult to use, I think, either as a customer or a or a or a client right it's the same well this is sort of that plus add in smart contracts for the payment and so it sits in escrow until completion and then That's survey nice. and then reputation and then rating and then that 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 and so, they, the, the middleman for these tutoring sites really does take a, a good cut i i believe i've never used them but i've i've looked into them before well, our first Neocache Newsmaker interview is out there and done. And if you wish to have your project highlighted by JJ, please contact me at JJ at NeocacheMedia.com. That's right. We're moving our communications to our new domain for our business. And NeocacheMedia.com is the way to get in contact with us. You can get in contact with Pedro, Darren, or myself by, con by using our name at NeocacheMedia.com. So... There's, there's that. So we got, we got stuff coming out and all kinds of things. We're also looking at developing another show, the more consistent show that looks at, uh, well, we'll talk about that in the future. A little tease right there. Any content on the Neocash Radio podcast and our website should not be regarded as financial or legal advice. Please be mindful of any and all regulations regarding cryptocurrency in your particular jurisdiction. Never invest slash gamble more than you're willing to lose and always safeguard your digital currency by keeping it in a, pro in a private wallet whose private keys you control. For Neocash Radio, this is JJ, Darren, and Pedro. Neocash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today.